<laughs> call the meeting to order. This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, February 6th. The time is 7 p.m. And I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. President Sussman. Here. Trustee Sussman. Here. Trustee Hamm. Here. Trustee Powell. Here. Trustee Valerie. Here. Here. Trustee Holt. Here. Also present, Village Clerk Kathy Haley. Village, Village Manager. Manager. <laughs> Our Village Attorney, Lance Molina. Here. And Michael Mars. Here. And I think that's everybody. <laughs> Thank you. We have a quorum. Uh, if you please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone, who came out on this very frigid night. It seems like it's never going to stop snowing. Um, so, if you're here, I appreciate it. If you're walking at work, watching from home, I don't blame you. That's where I would be, too. Uh, if you are here, you're welcome to speak at any time during our meeting. You may speak uh, at the time for public comment at the start of the meeting, or you may speak at any time uh, a particular agenda item comes up. Just, uh, I ask that you be recognized by the president, and you make your remarks from the podium so that everyone at home can hear and see you. Uh, first up is public comment. Would anyone like to address the board? Ms. Butter? Hi, good evening. I'm Jerry Buttermer. I live on Scottswood Road. Last fall, we reclaimed a strip of land to create a very low-cost connector of the suspension bridge and Swan Pond. It also provides landscaped areas with great views from the banks of the Des Plaines River. I and others who helped in that effort hope that this is one of the many collaborations with the village and other local bodies. I'm also pleased to report that after clearing the area of the weeds, vines, and weed trees, the team is now free from poison ivy. Now, if you cope well with the cold and the snow, it's invigorating to enjoy the riverfront all winter long. And there's no sweat, no bugs, and no itching. The strip of land that we reclaimed is a very low cost connector of the suspension bridge and swan pond as was recommended in the CMAP document. It restores a riverside walking route that has been overgrown and unavailable for decades. In CMAP terms, it is a forerunner of steps that will encourage recreational uses of our beautiful riverfront and encourage economic development. Those who came out and helped followed the leads of many who for decades helped maintain other parts of our landscape, river and recreation programs. To recognize the efforts of those citizens and to invite the community to join us, we've started a Facebook page where we present data and related links. The Facebook page also introduces a website and a blog as focal points for further information sharing and activism. Please view the pages, join the conversation, and share more images and stories. The Facebook page, the websites, links are in this document that I'll give you a copy of. And I'm providing the links here for that. But without them, the keywords to search are, quote, Riverside Riverfront as one word, or Riverside's Riverfront as two words. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bottomer. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move along then to <coughs> reports of village officers. Uh, first up is the village president's report, and I do have a motion to reappoint uh, two members of the Riverside Historical Commission, uh, Diane Saragioli and James Pretzelka, and I would ask for a motion and a second. Motion. Motion by Mr. Foley. Second. Second by Ms. Hamilton. Any discussion? Um, they are they are longtime members of the Historical Commission. They've been doing a wonderful job for many years, and we're fortunate that they have agreed to continue to serve. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate their service. If you would please call the roll. Trustee Fessler. Aye. Trustee Hamilton. Aye. Trustee Powell. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Foley. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, that is all I have this evening. Moving on, Mr. Manager. I just have one. Uh, 
one item, is, and that is to thank our Public Works Department for the hard work that the, the members have been doing this past year, or, or the first month into the new year. Um, it's been challenging and um, long, long days for them, and, and I know my, many of them are, are not looking forward to this weekend with the anticipated uh, snow that is expected to move into the area this coming Saturday. But I did want to let residents know that um, in regards to our rock salt supply, um, we have received another shipment of rock salt. However, um, because of the amount that we have um, and because this winter seems like it's going to be a prolonged one, um, we do need to use that um, judiciously. And so we will only be salting the main arterial streets and the streets um, uh, surrounding the schools. All residential streets will not be salted. We will keep up with the plowing um, and to help prevent any um, situations. Um, and if need be and warranted, we will address any issues that do arise from that. But I just did want to let residents know that and to ask them to please use caution and, and to um, drive slowly in those areas. That is all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did, did I understand, did I, uh, add, I read in the paper that North Riverside actually loaned us a little salt at one point when we needed some, is that right? Thank you, Anna. One of the characteristics of this winter uh, that uh, a lot of communities are experiencing beyond Riverside, but uh, it's, we have the issue of not being able to get salt, but the other issue is sporadic delivery. Um, in years past, you could pretty much, when you wanted salt, you could order it. You knew that you would get it with you know, a certain day or two. This year, you don't know when you're going to get it, so there's been times when the cupboard's been bare. I mean, we've been really kind of low with a, a snow event coming in, although we had salt on order. So um, in one instance, and public works departments do this anyway, sometimes just a matter of survival, but uh, we asked uh, North Riverside if they had salt available, access salt available, they did. They loaned us a couple truckloads, and uh, as it turns out, I think we did get the salt delivery before the snow event, but uh, you know, just, just to have some available, you have to kind of beg, borrow, and steal sometimes. Yeah, I was really gratified to read that. I thought that was really nice that we have that kind of cooperation with our neighbors. Yeah, it's been it's been challenging, and we received a 200-ton shipment uh, today. We had about 100 tons on hand. That's it. That's our entire order that we had left. Um, we really would be expecting to be stockpiling that for the next snow and ice season, which is only nine months away. Next November is when we, <laughs> we really have to be planning for it so it we'll have you know we'll have some discussions certainly at the administrative level and perhaps uh at the board level about whether or not we should and we'll have to go out on the market to buy more salt because the way this winter is going at 300 tons is not a lot of salt well, you you and your team have been doing a great job i mean i've i've heard from several residents that they might be in a neighboring community and things were pretty hard going and they, they drove into riverside and the streets were cleared so thanks has been challenging very pleased very proud of my employees they they've really done a good job obviously how many tons do you use for a, a snow event for the whole village well it depends on a snow event yeah. um and we could do something like 50 tons uh, for a significant snow event, but it's probably, especially now that we're just sparingly using it for the main streets and maybe around schools, uh, 10, 10 tons or something like that. It's like two truckloads, and we have three trucks, but uh, you know, it depends on the, on, the, uh, on the event, the type of snow, you know, different conditions, but we're, we're just trying to uh, be real judicious with this salt that we do have now, and we're going to be going easy on it, and hopefully less is more when we go up. Thank you. Anything else? No. Next up is the approval of the consent agenda. Do any items need to be removed for discussion by anyone? Hearing none, I would ask for a motion and a second to approve. So moved. Motion second. by Ms. Sussman, Good second good. by Mr. Ballerain. Please call the roll. Uh, Trustee Sussman. Aye. Trustee Hamilton. 
Aye. Trustee Park. Aye. Trustee Bellin. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Paul. Aye. Motion carries. We don't have any reports of departments or commissions tonight or any ordinances or resolutions to, to discuss. Uh, this evening has really been set aside as an opportunity for uh, the, the trustees and also we have all of our department heads here to just take a, a kind of a breather in this middle of this harsh winter to talk about kind of where we are, uh, things we've accomplished, things we want to accomplish in the year to come. So the first thing I would, I would like to do uh, is just to give some highlights uh, of projects that have been completed here in the last eight months or so. And uh, it would probably be easier if I just, let me just read through these quickly for those folks at home who are, are watching. Uh, these are some of the things that we've accomplished uh, to date. Uh, pursuant to this board's action, we paid off our uh, IMRF liability of well over $100,000 that had been accruing uh, interest at 7% for, uh, for the last several years. So that debt has now been retired. We vacated uh, two unused alleyways, which resulted in $12,000 of revenue for the village and also eliminated the need for uh, the maintenance and upkeep of those alleyways. A police department initiative on how to handle court calls uh, has resulted in projected annual savings of $10,000 going forward for the village. Our uh, finance department has been especially busy. Uh, we changed banks, thereby cutting the cost for banking services in half. Our ongoing annual savings ex is expected to be $8,000, uh, in addition to increasing the services provided by our bank. And we also have increased the ret rate of return on our investment um, over the Illinois funds rate. We also decreased hourly rate for uh, IT services by 27%, which allowed for an increase in our IT hours and services without any change to the budget. And these hourly rates have been locked in over the next few years. Uh, a major undertaking has been an updating of our village phone service to enhance service to our residents while also reducing cost. Uh, because of the work of our finance department, we were able to eliminate a number of lines no, no longer in service. Uh, and uh, which has resulted in an annual savings going forward of over $18,000. I'm told now we estimate it to be more in the $21,000 range. And we also updated village code uh, provisions regarding our water billing procedures and payments, and along with parking permits pr process and procedures, and both of these will also increase revenue. Now, the reason that I, I, I specifically wanted to highlight those items is the items that I just listed constitute an annual savings to our village in excess of $50,000 annually moving forward. And every single one of those initiatives, with the exception of the vote by this board with regard to the IMF, was, was accomplished by staff initiatives. On their own behest, they went out and they found this money on behalf of our residents. And I just think it's important from time to time to acknowledge the kind of work that our staff does. Uh, nobody would have known about these savings had they not found them. They went out, they found them, and it's of great benefit to our residents. And we greatly appreciate the initiative and hard work that our staff is, is showing with regard to cost, cost effectiveness. Um, other things that we have accomplished, we decreased the estimated rate of return on our police pension fund to a more realistic estimate of 7.5% to more realistically reflect market expectations and increased our pension fund tax levy accordingly. Uh, this board passed a 2014 budget that projects a year-end surplus while also providing a realistic accounting of the costs associated with necessary village services. And we are also undertaking a comprehensive review of sidewalk maintenance and replacement that will take place in 2014, along with exploring alternate uh, alternatives for need repairs to our train station. And of uh, Significance to going forward, we began an enhanced enforcement of our property maintenance ordinances and building code compliance. And this program will continue in earnest in 2014 with uh, we are going to start enforcing our laws. 
The Cable Commission uh, began broadcasting both the Riverside, Riverside Township and the District 96 school board meetings. Again, an initiative uh, created by the Cable Commission itself with the help of, of uh, Trustee Ballerine, the liaison. And this has greatly increased the transparency of some of our other intergovernmental bodies with regard to uh, letting folks know out there know what's going on with our, our schools and our township. And in the same vein as the building and property maintenance, the police have begun uh, an enhanced enforcement of traffic violations with an emphasis on speed and stop sign and cell phone <coughs> use violations within village boundaries. And I've already seen flashing lights around the village, so they're not kidding about this. So put the phones away, stop at the stop signs and drive the speed limit. And also, I'm glad to say that the Village Board has renewed a village-wide commitment to emphasize uh, sustainable policies and practices moving forward. Also before the trustees is a list of the CMAP priorities that this board approved uh, back in July of last year. I won't bore the folks at home by going through it. These packets are available online if you go to our village website and you can see a list basically telling you of the, the, the work that has been on these has been done on these various initiatives. I'm especially proud uh, that this board has accomplished a major overhaul of our commission structure and the permit and site review process that is, has already paid dividends. We have already had situations where uh, working with some of our local businesses, we have significantly streamlined the, the time and the cost involved with, uh, with some of their planned expansions and developments. So that was a, that was a major accomplishment. Um, I will not bore everyone with reading through the rest of this, but suffice it to say that we have made great strides in the last eight months with regard to the CMAP initiatives that this board approved. And I am quite confident that our, our commissions, which seem to all have a kind of a renewed spirit, uh, that, uh, that they are going to move forward aggressively in, in fulfilling these projects in the, in the months and the year to come. So that is the recap. Are there, were there any comments or did anyone else want to mention anything in particular that I might have glossed over? So now we get to the fun stuff. Now, now we're going to move on to talking about 2014. We're not going to talk about the next winter is only nine months away. Mr. Bailey, thank you for that. <laughs> That's why we have you, exactly. So what we're really going to be talking about tonight is, are the, the general kind of policy themes that we want our, our staff in particular to be focused on in, in the year to come. Uh, it, is not our, it is not our intent to say that these are all projects that are going to be completed in the, in the year to come, but it is certainly uh, our intent that these are the focus points of, of the various departments in the, in the coming years. So what I thought I would do first uh, is just go through, I provided a summary uh, memorandum to the trustees that uh, I worked on along with the village manager and staff, and it sets out, out some general Hi, Joe. Sets out some general parameters uh, and general policy themes. And so let me just, let me just read those first. Uh, we could probably have a, a general discussion about the themes themselves. And after that, we can go back and go through each, each of the themes. And under them, there are some various projects that, that are listed for consideration. So the first one is to, and this is an ongoing process forever, is to improve our public communication and governmental efficiencies. Uh, the process I just talked about with regard to the streamlining of our ordinances and our commissions would be an example of that. Second is to develop non-traditional policies and practices for public work services with an emphasis on sustainability and long-term cost efficiencies. Next is to enhance community development policies and practices to better enforce codes and streamline development within the context of Riverside's historic legacy. Next, to finance the future through increased intergovernmental cooperation and creative use of alternative revenue streams. Next is to increase efficiencies and cost savings for public safety through innovative policies and practices and last but not least is to enhance the beautification of our public green spaces and recreational facilities. So I guess the first thing I would ask is if there is general agreement that these are items we, that we want to 
work for, work toward this, this year, and are there any other general themes that, that the trustees might be interested in, in discussing as well? I think this pretty well captures the general themes, at least in my opinion it does, unless anyone else has something else to bring up. So the, the I, I would just say under, um, sorry, I forgot my glasses today, so I have to make this bigger. Um, <laughs> under um, development, not traditional policies, train station repair, maybe adaptive reuse for the okay, train we're station. Gonna, we'll go back, we're going to go back and go through all the individual okay. items. Just would add that to that section. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. The um, only item I would add, I, because I think it, of its importance, it should be expressly repeated, is continued implementation of CMAP as a, as a category in, in, equal to all of these categories. That's an excellent point. I mean, I, you know, I guess the reason I didn't put it, this on here because that is so, it's being so driven by staff and commissions, but I agree that that, yeah, so we'll, we'll so continued implementation of CMAP priorities. Anything else? Okay. Well, let's, let, let's go back now and start going through these. One of the things that staff has asked uh, to the degree that we can uh, is as we go through each of these General items has 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 some examples listed. Uh, we can go through the examples. We can also consider any other specific examples that, that you might have. Um, and staff would like us to the degree possible to to try to prioritize the, the our interests in these various items. And if there are uh, if there are examples that are listed under any of these on which there is not a consensus that we should move forward on, uh, we can certainly set those aside for 2014 uh, because we have. This village is going to be around for a long time. We don't have to do everything in one year. So let's start off uh, with improved public communication and governmental efficiencies. This is really the one that's most in, in our wheelhouse. And the, the first example under here is to enhance public communication and information, including an updated website and improved telephone, electronic, and in-person communication. To improve the agenda format for our meetings and our meeting structure to research the feasibility and desirability of providing tablets to the trustees uh, for our meetings, to improve broadcast quality of and accessibility to our, our meeting videos, and to increase staff support of commissions. So are there, any, is there, are there any of these items that you would like to discuss in particular? Before we... The tablets for the for the board. We all have our own tablets. Mm -hmm. um, but Mike, one of my questions is if if there was any issue that arose, can through open meetings our tablets be confiscated for look or whatever? I mean, that's the only thing that worries me is because my tablet is also my my First. link to my my home computer and. And I use it for my business, and, and I, I would be, yeah, be the, in trouble if I didn't have it. The official business records are maintained on the village site so that you'd be calling up copies. I mean, you're, they would be no different than the copies you have when you have hard copies. The official minutes, the official records of the village remain the original documents, which are maintained by the clerk, and the electronic documents would be the ones on the Riverside Village website. What about the, emails? That's what I'm uh, more yeah, concerned emails, about. Emails, th this, this is a changing area. There's a, a case that came out of uh, Champaign <coughs> County that looks at emails, and basically emails you have, according to this case, and it is not, not a Supreme Court case, but if the emails are between less than a majority of a quorum, like from one trustee to another, they remain personal emails and they are not public records according to this case. Um, but that's different from when you're using a tablet. I mean, for let's say when you're looking at your board packet electronically instead of on a copy, instead of a hard copy, there would be no change there. Email policy, you know, that's something that you need to be aware of, but it would be unaffected by tablets. Do you know what I'm saying, Joe? Well, I mean, let's 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 say, for example, I uh, we have we all have a village email account. Correct. And whenever we conduct village business, I think it would probably 
behoove us to make sure that we use that village email account. This is, a, this is an evolving area. Before the Champagne case, I would have said yes. And I would have said that any time a trustee is discussing public business, even with a resident, you should do it on the village site because it's a public record. The Champaign County case says no. If it's an email discussing public business with a constituent or with just another trustee that's less than a majority of a quorum, it's not a public record and doesn't have to be maintained as such. Okay. Well, okay, so it's an evolving area. You know, it's really, but it's not really related to tablets directly. It's more of a, it's a burgeoning area of what's covered by Open Meetings Act, what's covered by FOIA, what is a public record. The, the Champaign County case touched on those things because it had um, uh, council members that were texting each other during a public meeting. <laughs> And, you know, so that part of the case didn't come out well for what the municipality was arguing, but there were surprisingly other aspects of the FOIA and other things that came out, we thought, surprisingly uh, beneficial toward minimizing what you have to keep track of as a public record, because it can be a great burden. So I, I think, you know, to take from that, I mean, I really, as long as we use, as long as we use common sense, as long as we use our village Emails. our village accounts, as long as we don't fall victim to the reply all mistake with regard to open meetings, right. that, I suspect, that remains, oh, I suspect yeah, that we can take this one off yeah. the list, that given that everyone already, that's it. okay. Ms. Ms. Sussman. Yes, I, I, when I look at this list, the staff and the board have been working on a lot of this. Improving the agenda format and meeting structure is something that you and, and our village manager are constantly doing. Um, the tablets we just took off the list. We can talk about the quality and accessibility of videos. Maybe uh, Mr. Ballerine can. And increased staff support for commissions we're already working on or have already done. It does seem to me that enhancing public communication, particularly for me, the website is a top priority. Peter, the, our village manager, has made sure now that there's coverage at the front desk eight hours a day, whenever the office is open, there's somebody at the front desk, so people are alternating lunch hours, as I'm sure Kathy can attest to, um, and as much as possible answering the phone. It's, it's much less frequent now when I call in that I get the automatic answering thing. It hardly ever happens. And if it does and I push zero, I, almost, I always get somebody. So, but, it does, but I would like to, for me, a priority is to improve our website. I think that's something that residents and non-residents alike go to. Would you like that? And, um, and if what we're talking about is prioritizing staff time and eventually coming back and looking at costs, not tonight, I want to make very clear, I'm not right. trying to understand the costs. That, for me personally, um, is, it is, um, it is a top priority, making sure we have a process in place for updating automatically information. We have old information on there, out of date information on there, and that we do something to make it more customer friendly, the whole website. So that would be my, pri if you're asking for priorities under the, the, the heading, that would be my priority. And that actually is one of the things that staff is going to be working on um, with the new phone. Um, uh, with the new phones, which we're hoping to make the switch um, beginning of March, mm -hmm. there will be redundancy within the system where if, if one line that you call in on is busy, it will kick on to, to the next person, and then the next, you won't necessarily have to press a button, and it'll get you to a live person. So um, I feel that we're heading in that direction with that. With the website, I agree with you. Um, I think the website is... Uh, it needs a fresh look, and um, one of the things that we will be working on this year is is conducting a, a RFP for website services. So um, that hopefully will be addressed this year as well. So, well, that's my vote for number one. Um, and to segue your question about in, improved broadcast broadcast quality, you know, last year we purchased HD cameras. Um, Currently, um, I mean, our goal at the Cable Commission was try to get, try to fill the content uh, of a 24-hour cycle, um, where before we were, we had, we we had to burn to CDs and then play CDs, and that's how it was aired. Now it now it streams right out of our computers. So um, our our quality that's coming 
from our cameras that are off site are, are very good because they're HD quality and then they go right to the computer and then that shifts right into the right onto the, the system and it's all HD quality. Um, the, the quality that we're, we're getting into this room is not quite as good because it's filmed in HD and then it has to travel through all the lines and it gets through the switchers and, and it, it degrades just a little bit but uh, I still think it's pretty pretty darn good quality. Um, but that's going to be addressed this year with uh, a new switcher that we're doing. <laughs> Um, accessibility to meeting videos. I mean, it, it was only a few, you know, years back that if you didn't have um, Comcast, you couldn't, you, you had no idea what was going on in the, the village unless you came to these meetings. Um, and you, you know, if you didn't go to a District 96 meeting, you, you had no idea, you know, what's going on there or the township meetings. Now all of those are being broadcast not only on, on uh, TV, but also on the Riverside TV.us website. So you can always go to Riverside TV.us and there is a list of all the videos and you can clip on to any of the uh, board meetings, township meetings or District 96 meetings. So if you ever wanted to go back or look or archive or whatever, or miss something, um, uh, you 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 can you can do that. So I think we we're, we're the commission has done a great job, um, not only increasing the the, the content, uh, improving the quality, and making it as accessible as it possibly can to as many people as we as we possibly can. Is is that the Riverside TV US? Is that the same as the YouTube Riverside TV? The Riverside TV US is a is a website that is that. The commission developed. The YouTube is a separate. I mean, and, and uh, on that website there is a list of all the YouTube videos. Okay. You can also subscribe to Riverside TV on YouTube, and anytime a new video gets uplinked, you you get an email, uh, so you can access it both ways. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I agree that the website is important. Uh, that, that needs to be updated. I don't know, are there links to what you just described on the website? There. Okay, good, good. But as, uh, we, as we move forward, there are, I think, economic development is putting up a website and a couple other commissions, and, and you know, all of a sudden these things are getting splintered, and you're right, we need to make sure we link all those things. Um, I wanted to emphasize uh, the last item, increased staff support of commissions. Um, I haven't been around long enough and been to enough com other commission meetings. I've been to a lot of planning commission meetings, but that's really, really been it. Um, but I want to, I think that's important. I, and I'm not saying we're not doing a good job as it is, I, as far as I know we are. Uh, but that is so important because this is a village that is, is so volunteer dependent. So much of what we do is done by volunteers. Having worked in other villages, I know what other villages are like. Riverside's unique in that respect. Uh, we, we really do depend a lot on our volunteers. So we have to be absolutely certain that they're getting the background research, the minute taking, the uh, agenda preparation, everything they need to be successful and to do their jobs well. So. I think that should be highlighted, and we should always be looking for ways to, to, to accomplish that, to make sure that they're getting the support they need. Um, likewise, on a much smaller scale, uh, one of my pet peeves, uh, minor little pet peeves I have here, is I find this room very uncomfortable to sit at for two hours. And I would really like to see us, and maybe this falls under staff support of commissions or whatever, but I would really like, to, I'm, you know, it would be nice to have a nice fancy boardroom. I'm not asking for that, though. I'm just suggesting that we look into a way where we can get tables where three people actually fit into the tables and we're not, you know, falling off the edge, uh, things like that. Uh, I would really like to see that looked into. and see if we can't do anything there. Or we can limit our board meetings to only an hour. That would work too, I guess. <laughs> I, I do the best maybe, I can. Maybe that's the whole intention <laughs> by, by Peter is to that's make right. it's uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah, we don't want you too comfortable, exactly. Okay, anything else under this general theme? 
time frame. Let's move on then. Next is uh, to develop non-traditional policies and practices for public work services with an emphasis on sustainability and long-term cost efficiencies. Um, under this item are, is the train station repair with an eye toward adaptive reuse, uh, sidewalk maintenance and repair, uh, consideration of increasing our green infrastructure projects, including our larger parking lots, and very apropos, uh, snow and ice response, and in particular, including uh, different substances other than ubiquitous salt. Uh, it seems to me that, that, I mean, our public works department has shown its mettle, I think, fully this, this winter. Uh, these are all things that are already underway. It seems, uh, I mean, I don't know that this particular item lends itself toward prioritization, because these are really all moving forward in, in in parallel, but are there any particular items that you'd like to address? I just have a comment about the, yes. the train station and train station repair slash adaptive reuse. I think the train station is one of our really iconic buildings, and so I think this that we really need to take a hard look at at the maintenance of that and the and the use of it. And uh, uh, I would not like to see that fall by the wayside just because it's a big ticket item. Ed, would you like to just um, I know I know all of these items have been items that that we've talked about right. in the past do you would you like just to run through and just kind of give us an update of kind of where we are on these on these various items um, I can speak to I think all of them um, as far as the train depot, the sig most significant thing I've spent time on is the roof issue. And uh, we've corresponded with the State Historic Preservation Officer I've, uh, Office. I've spoken with an architect from the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, we, should be, we should not be surprised, I guess, that the State Historic Preservation Office really wants those, those roof tiles replaced with like uh, roof tiles. It's a gothic type of uh, design of tile. The company that um, manufactured those back in 1901 is still in business. Um, we have a grant application in for the roof replacement right now and we'll, I think, find out this month whether or not that was successful. I have uh, investigated some other alternatives, just representative-wise, um, including um, a more of a standard, uh, like this gothic tile style that's on a, on a uh, train station roof right now, that's a special order from that company. The company also has another, uh, well, several other, but there's a certain design, like a French style tile, that's kind of off the shelf for them. That's several hundred thousand dollars less um, to install on a roof than this gothic style. Um, there's also composite materials that are available these days. They're surprisingly not inexpensive, but they offer things like 50-year warranties. Um, they can be, you can um, get them to mimic different natural materials like um, the Stone Avenue station, Metro station in LaGrange currently has a project underway where they're installing composite, uh, a composite roofing on it. The retail complex at Ogden Avenue and LaGrange Road there's a, like a Chipotle and a Trader Joe's and a Walgreens. The roof of that has a uh, composite roofing material also that I think is supposed to be mimicking slate. So I have a uh, significant amount of uh, research on that. Uh, I don't know that you really want to go through in no. depth into it now, but um, I have had some thoughts that uh, the interior of the train depot could be painted. I think it needs repainting. Uh, I'm listening to you folks as you talk about reusing it and turning it in, maybe reusing it more, adaptive reuse. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm kind of waiting for you all to decide what you want to do. Another thing to think about it within the context of the train depot is the platform, the brick platform, which has uh, you know, it's deteriorated and it's one of those things that should be on a list for uh, replacement or overhaul. Um, as far as the snow and ice control uh, issues, I'm, I'm very um, interested in introducing liquids to our uh, operation, one of the key components to melting ice and snow faster. I've been thinking that I was going to um, pursue that under 
the operational budget, but the op my operational budget is taking a heavy blow this year. So I don't know how that's going to go for this year, but we're definitely poised to have everything in line so we can start next year. I don't know that it'll have to be capital expense because I don't think it's that expensive to get into it. There's some expense, but it isn't a huge expense. Um, what is it? Beet juice, basically. It's your, uh, that's, that's yeah, that's beet juice, that's usually that's with salt brine. Um, that's one of the things that really uh, accelerates ice melting is liquid. You know, there's a, it's like a three-legged stool since you asked. Here I go. It, you know, the melting agent, which is salt, uh, heat, which is friction a lot of times. That's from uh, vehicles driving over the snow and ice pack or the sunlight. And the other is liquid. Um, right now, what we do, the only thing we have in our arsenal is a plow and dry rock salt. And that's going way back. It's, that's what all we've had. Uh, I think with liquids, we can certainly be more effective. We should be able to be more economical because we should be able uh, to get the snow and ice removed more effectively, reducing the amount of salt we use and uh, over time. Um, then do we have to have a different type of vehicle to no. spread? No. What, I think the most significant thing, capital-wise or expense-wise, would be retrofitting the, the plow trucks right now with tanks on them. Because mm. the key thing is, to me, the key goal is to provide a, uh, well, it's called pre-wetting, the salt at the spreader bar, or at the spreader at the back of the truck. That's where you introduce the, the liquid when the salt is being broadcast on the street. So it's not really a capital-intensive project and communities typically kind of gerrymander, jerry-rig things, uh, equipment to experiment a little bit and make them work. I have a suggestion. I know somebody who's a trustee who pickles beets. <laughs> Joe? <laughs> I pickle pickles. I never oh, pickled I a beet. Well, pickle juice works too, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can, yeah, you can. Yeah. Exclusively all they use is, is pickles. And pickles in, in Vermont, I think. Yeah. So, Joe? Yeah, that's Using it. cheese by product in Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> I've, it's one of these things that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a binding agent or whatever. It's, uh, it, you use what you can get. Um, I forgot the other two items that were on. Uh, the the sidewalk, sidewalk. Maybe. Sidewalks. Uh, I developed proposals to have them inspected. This is village-wide inspection. Um, those are max, should be maximum costs that I've shown you. Um, Will we continue the discussion of going back to broom concrete versus exposed aggregate? You, that would be at your, your level. Um, this is, you know, we're, uh, by ordinance, we install exposed aggregate sidewalks and, and uh, driveway aprons if you all, of course, it's your right and prerogative to change that or keep it the same, whatever you want to do. With, for um, me, for me, just frankly, it's just concrete. Whether it's exposed aggregate or brushed, uh, brushed concrete, is just, it's just. Uh, I, I know it's hard to say with the winter we're having, but when would you expect to to start addressing sidewalk maintenance and, and replacement in the spring? Well, uh, the first thing would be inspecting, um, uh, and depending upon the scope of the project, uh, we certainly. Won't do any inspecting till after the snow leaves the sidewalks. We don't know when that will be. It'll be later than typical. I am still, you know, I, I work with this group of public works directors from the surrounding communities where we try to combine our quantities. Uh, we're still, tr we're, we're trying to do a combined sidewalk concrete project this year. So, you know, I'm interested in some kind of fin finality on how we're going to proceed with this issue so that uh, I'll know if we can participate in that joint purchasing program. Um, but it's, um, you know, it's really dictated by the weather at this point. I do have a, um, a comment. I, I understand that, to President Sell's point, that these are all important projects. The snow and the ice, sounds like you're just waiting for an opportunity sure. to move on it. And the train station, we're waiting to hear about the grant. In the way, for me, I think there is a priority. I look at the sidewalk maintenance, and Ben, you've actually talked about this as a public safety issue. And I think that that, in this case, supersedes some of the, if you were to rank them, which is what the memo was and what you introduced this was, I would certainly say that public safety under these different categories is important. And I know that we've had incidences of people falling 
breaking legs. Um, I know that, that Ed and his team have been very successful at repairing sidewalks that lead to our schools so that the kids are safe walking to school. But there are a lot of sidewalks that are still quite, um, where people could fall, how's that? And, uh, and I do think that that's a priority for, for Ed in terms of, of um, time and eventually when we look at funding. I mean, I, I would definitely agree with that. But could I ask you, Trustee Foley, to work with Mr. Bailey? Because it sounds like he needs direction from us sooner yeah, than later. And, and that's why I, I lean towards the broom concrete. We save 2 to $3 a square foot each square at 25 square feet. It's a $75 upwards per square. For every two that we do, we could get a free one. So we're able to, to get through Ed's problem with the bad squares much quickly if we revert back to a broom concrete finish. The surface is non-compliant in an ADA world. You don't see other communities doing it. Um, so it's, it's not a green practice, but yes, Mr. President, well, I will say, work can, with that. Because we don't worry, we're not going to try to, 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 to decide it. But, but can you can you meet yes, with sir. Mr. Bailey, and especially given the time frame that he just said yeah. with the our, our other communities, and then bring it well, back to he, us? Yes, he said there'll be snow till June or July. Well, I was going to so say, you know, well, who knows <laughs> if we're going to be able to see the sidewalks. That's, we have that's nine months thing. to work on this. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Man, I'm ready for the winter to be over, believe me. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. OK. Mr. Yes, please. A rich rate, 262 Lionel. A couple of comments on the train station. A couple of years ago, under another regime, uh, I went up in the attic to look at the condition of the trusses that are supporting the roof. Now, you may not realize the truss, there's a truss, there's a, a truss on the main part of the building, and then there's an outrigger where the roof breaks and changes. There's an outrigger that goes out. I was concerned because, in my opinion, walking around the train station, I saw some drooping of those uh, soffits, okay? So I went up there and looked at, at those, and I think I have some photographs and, uh, of what I saw. The trusses are in fine condition. There was no sign of any leakage of the roof. And the, um, some of the outworkers riggers looked like they had been replaced. Now, I've lived in the village about 40 years. When we first designated that, we, we first restored that building. It was a uh, long time ago now when, when, when we did that. I'm not even sure of the year. But there is a plaque, if you want to call it that, mounted near the door at the uh, west end that uh, is faded because it's on paper, but that won an award from the uh, uh, Northeast chapter of the uh, American Institute of Architects for restoration. That was in the days before restoration became popular, okay? Um, I'm still concerned about that a little bit, that uh, maybe some of those outriggers need to be replaced. And I wrote a, uh, a report, which I sent to the village at the time. Peter, I don't think you were here yet uh, when, when that happened. No, I think that, that, was, uh, that was before you and made recommendations on it. Um, there's something that really concerns me. The original leaders, downspouts, you know them as, were round corrugated leaders. And when some work was done on the gutters a few years back, uh, they were changed to rectangular. Well, what the problem is that you're stuffing a rectangular uh, thing into a round hole because the gutter has a round opening, OK? I don't know how they managed to do that, but I have noticed that there's a lot of leaking around those, uh, those scupper heads. And um, what I was afraid of is that that water was working itself back into those riggers, into the fascias, okay? And I'm still worried about that. We tried to stuff a rectangular peg into a round hole, 
That's pretty hard to do. <laughs> Sounds like government. Okay, now, I know the reason why. Uh, it was because we couldn't find, or the person who did it couldn't find round gutters that were pre-finished, and you could find the rectangular gutters that were pre-finished. Well, in fact, the round gutters pre-finished do exist. I used to do a lot of uh, roofing restoration for school districts, and I found them, and they are made. Number one, and I made sure I used them, so I didn't try to shove a rectangular peg into a round hole. That's, that's a concern to me. So I think we ought to look at that, you know? The other thing is, uh, at the, uh, well, I'm, I was into roof restoration for a lot of years, okay? And um, I do know of one party that salvages clay tile, roofing clay tile. So those clay tile are, in fact, available. I know that for a fact. I have the name of, the, of a party who does that. And um, uh, I talked to them at uh, the uh, CRCA show, the Chicago Roofing Contractors Association show back in January, a few weeks back. And the, um, they would uh, be willing to send the, uh, somebody out to look at our train station and give us an idea of how much of the tile would have to be replaced. We do not need to strip that roof. Absolutely no doubt about that. Some of it does need some replacing. And if we got into some outrigger uh, rebuilding, that would mean there would be a major six or 10 foot section of tile which would have to be removed, stacked, and reinstalled. And, and salvaged pieces replacing those that uh, are damaged. I would certainly not favor changing the style because that that would be a problem from the standpoint of the historic aspect of the train station. I'm not in favor of replacing it with a synthetic product. I think that it has to be fixed with the original tile that was on the roof, and it can be done. It's not a big deal. It's done all the time, okay? So I offer those, those concerns to you. Number one is, do we have failing outriggers? Number two, are we getting water infiltration going back into our soffits as a result of the improper marrying of the round hole with the, with the rectangular downspout? Um, and if the, uh, the, the roof being uh, repaired with the proper product, they are available. Okay. The other thing is, I was under the impression we used Beetlejuice last year. Huh? Yeah, the beet juice. juice. Didn't we? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. I guess not, huh? No. We didn't. Okay. I know it was, the board was under the impression that it was used. I was under the impression it was used. It was stated right here it was going to be used at this podium. So uh, I was surprised to hear you say that. The, Richard, that report that you, you're talking about that you did on the, when you went up there, is, do you still have a copy of that? I probably do. <laughs> well, I mean, if we can't find I bet that would that'd probably be an interesting background for, yeah. for Ed to have his hands on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was uh, when Cool Hand was still here. <coughs> and his assistant, remember the young man that was assistant for a number of years? And we, uh, uh, Mr. Scalera will contact you about the information about the salvage. Hmm? Mr. Sclair will contact you about getting the information about the okay. salvage place that has and, the files. And I really would recommend that we, we do, in fact, put upon this people and have somebody look at it and say, um, you know, maybe 10% and, you know, uh, they're going to have Grandpa do it, you know, not the young fella that was at the booth. They were going to ask Grandpa to do it. Mr. Bailey? Okay. Let me just say that I'll look to see if I can find Mr. Ray's report. I, I attended probably the same roofing convention, probably talked to the same 
vendor about, I, I am aware that there are probably um, salvage tiles to match this out on the salvage market. Um, part of that is to examine the existing tiles to determine whether or not there's, it's feasible, uh, there's enough life left in them to uh, warrant buying new tiles to match the existing. Uh, the salvage tiles. Right. Yeah. They last forever. Yeah. Just talking about the same thing. Until yeah. they're broken, yeah. there's not a lifespan to that tile. Yeah. We're on the same page. Broken. We're on the same page. Yep. Okay. Um, the other thing is that uh, a year or so ago, I had the salt stockpile pre-treated with beet juice. It was it was on the uh, uh, in the yard. It wasn't it wasn't <laughs> wet then. It was simply had the material on it that would, uh, well, it's the least expensive way to go about it, but it's, uh, it's also the least effective use of beet juice, so I decided not to pursue that anymore. It's more important, I think, to really be adding the liquid at the spreader at the back of the truck. So I did experiment with that, and like I say, it was the least expensive way to go, but least effective, and I didn't think it was worthwhile going further. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wright. So, Let's move on to the, our, our next general theme, which is to enhance the community development policies and practices to better enforce codes and streamline development within the context of Riverside's historic legacy. Two items under here, and these have already been touched on, is to enhance the enforcement of property maintenance and building code violations and to increase efficiencies in processes and procedures for permitting inspections, site review, variation, and development. Peter, do you want to give us just a brief overview of where we are on that. Sure. Well, in regards to the first um, matter, the village uh, a few months ago launched the doorknob campaign where our code enforcement officer um, went to every resident in Riverside and any property that had a building code violation um, was given a door hanger and they had a certain time to comply. She um, has um, we then during that process also brought the adjudication hearing process for those violations from Maybrook to Riverside in house. We haven't had our first hearing. Um, we anticipate that probably being in March, where we have our first case of um, being brought before a hearing officer for determination if they failed to rectify the issues that were identified. Um, and then the second. It's just an ongoing process that um, um, working with the, the um, current staff, um, looking at ways to improve how we do things and how to work more effectively with the community, which may involve some reorganization at a later date. Does this include um, streamlining for businesses and that type of thing? Would that be included under here, or is that a different issue? Well, the work that the board did in regards to um, the steps that a applicant need, would need to follow um, to get a approval for a certain type of business has already kind of done that. Um, I think one of the, the things that, that staff is going to work on is more of the um, as soon as we make that contact with an individual interested in a property, working with that individual quickly to answer any questions that they may have so that they then can move quickly on deciding whether or not the location that they're looking at is the right um, location for them. Um, and then as much as possible, working with them um, to quickly uh, answer any questions that they may have so that they're not um, bogged down in, in the, um, the permit process. So there's really no prior, I'm sorry, there's really no prioritization here, right? Because they're both in play. Yeah. I'd like to see this area augmented to include um, code enforcement within the business district. Um, I think that there's room for improvement there. I'd particularly like to see code enforcement of our sign criteria. And I'd like the staff to look at some innovative methods to come up with to, um, if assistance is needed, to figure out ways to gently assist our business owners to uh, coming up with signs that are compliant to our existing sign criteria, because they're not. I'd also like to see uh, the staff work on establishing storefront criteria to make sure that the storefronts we have within our business 
district are attractive, the most attractive possible. And uh, I'd also like to, and I, and this, this last item that I'm going to mention, uh, we may already have this underway, so I apologize if I'm, um, you know, chewing over uh, something here. But um, I want to make sure that in addition to the other governmental efficiencies that we're doing with computer and everything, that we are doing uh, good database collection and statistical evaluation within our public works and building department. Um, so that we have a good statistical beta database that's easy for our employees to update, that's searchable, so that when we want information on, um, you know, on construction and other things, that we have a good database for that. So, okay. so those are my. I will, I will say, with regard to, uh, you're the liaison with planning and zoning. Do you, you would you like to just review what they're doing with regard to the the signage? Sure. Yeah, they're, they're getting ready to look at signs, and uh, at their February and March meetings, they'll be reviewing that and <clears throat> making recommendations. Signs in the CBD, but also in the B1 district as mm -hmm. well. So they talked about that at their first meeting just briefly, and we'll continue to talk about it the next two months. And are they going to talk about bringing non-compliant signs into yes. compliance? Good. They, they, they already talked briefly about incentives, how to how mm -hmm. to incentivize businesses to Good. bring signs into conformance. That's great. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and our, our village attorney has already offered some some advice with regard to that. So they're going to be moving forward on, on those items. I, I'm just curious. The I thought it was an excellent idea about a storefront policy. Is that under the plan commission or is that really a building uh, code issue that can be handled perhaps more quickly? Sure, it can, it can be either. Um, it's not even necessarily codified. It's more just direction to put in a, a facade improvement incentive program. Um, and so I know staff is working on that. And also to look at what similar villages with, uh, with of approximately our same age or our, our same character, what they're doing in terms of storefront criteria. I know that they have programs. You know. I think that's an excellent idea. So we do have a, a facade improvement program going on, or at least we're no. starting to talk. I, I thought you said that. No. They're, they're looking into it. We're, we're looking at it. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I, yeah, but we are already looking at it. Yes. Yeah, OK. Just had a, a follow-up question. Uh, <coughs> Trustee Hampton met, mentioned databases and record keepings. What Do, do we have a uh, we do have laser a, fish or uh, scanning uh, program wow. for records? Uh, I, that's, I haven't heard laser fish in a long time. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, we have, it's, it's a we keep software. We right next to the typewriters, Doug. <laughs> that, well, no, that's, uh, but you know what that's not said? microfilming. I'm not talking about microfilming. I remember I'm that. Scanning. I, I remember that from school. <laughs> okay. um, Just keep digging, Peter. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm Red as it is, um, we do have a computer software program. It's called Bob's Code, um, not because Bob is <laughs> the director of the building department, but um, it, it was developed by an intern that we had here that um, the building department currently utilizes as their database hub, where any permits that have been issued or any code violations. Um, are all entered into this database, okay. and it has a picture of the house so that um, you, when you pull it up, you can see what it looks like. That's what we're currently using. I think one of the things that we're, we can probably start looking at is the GIS does have a platform um, that we can probably try to pull some of that information into the GIS that will then help us plot better where we're having a, the greater concentration of issues, um, as well as it just gives it more added redundancy to that software program. So in, in the event one goes, we still have a backup. Okay. Mr. Wright? Sure. I'd like to talk a little bit about the sidewalk situation. Can I can I just interrupt you before you get started? Because what we're not trying to get into detail about specific projects tonight. No, I, I, I want I want to offer you some background information. Okay. 
long before there was a preservation commission, the plan commission, which I was a member of, undertook the process of restoring the train station. And initially, you may recall, there was a bank uh, occupying that, that space. And when the, uh, the railroad that provided us with a grant to do that restoration required us to extend the platforms beyond what they were, some 300 or 600 feet to accommodate a 10-car train. We went to concrete. And after a, a lot of back and forth, we decided to, to go with an exposed concrete. So if you look at the plane train platforms, that was the original exposed concrete in this town. And that's seeded. That's what we call seeded, where that special aggregate is broadcast onto the concrete after it's darbied initially and goes through the breakdown process just before the finishing process. Then the hard troweling is done, and then there's a fine spray that washes the, the cement paste off of the surface of the aggregate. Okay, that's the process that was used there. And the consideration for going to an exposed aggregate, since we had to go to concrete, uh, we were able to reuse the brick for the part of this platform which is now brick. That was the original brick part of the platform. But we, they wouldn't give us the money to extend that brick. So we had to go to that concrete system. If you walk down the sidewalk along the river here, from here to Miller Road, you will see two or three exposed aggregate, four or five exposed aggregate concretes. Some of them date back to the 20s. The original sidewalks that were put in this town were in fact exposed aggregate. In those days, the way it was done was you, you poured the concrete, you, you let it cure for a day or two, and then you came back with a very, very stiff mixture of a fine aggregate, and that's a granite, and you hard trowel that on. This is in the days when guys actually knew how to finish concrete, you know? You hard trowel that on, okay? And that's what those sidewalks are. Okay, and there's two types. One is uses the the uh, granite that sort of gives you a gray effect, and the other one is the granite that gives you that reddish effect. I don't know how that happened. I have not been able to to find out when which was done and why that all <laughs> happened. But as I say, if you walk down the sidewalk as far as it goes all the way down to the forest reserve along uh, the river, you will see some of that original in gray and in red. And then you will see the attempts that were made to, uh, and you'll see a lot of it that's, that's uh, a bro broomed, the broomed aggregate, because when a deep tunnel was done, they had to tear up a lot of those sidewalks and they would not do it in exposed aggregate. The village would have to pay extra to get it done in exposed aggregate. So those sidewalks went back in, back in, in uh, broomed surface. And that done right, and it isn't done right anymore, but in the old days when it was done right, you actually hard trowel the concrete. You, you went through your breakdown, and then you hard troweled it, so it was smooth, and then you brushed it. Then you brushed it, see? So you had a sound surface. If you had chert, what they call chert, chert is, a, is the aggregate that, that uh, takes water in, and uh, then expands and cracks. You, you'd get some of that happening, but 
around here we use all limestone because that's what the quarries have. That's, that's what we use in this part of the country, or this part of the state. There's all limestone aggregate. So we don't have that problem. The board adopted a mixture for the concrete that included the exposed, ag or the, the decorative aggregate all the way through. So it's no longer broadcast, okay? That's what was adapted uh, by the board as the official sidewalk for Riverside. So what do we got? We got the original ones that you see in the Central Business District, which I was also on the Central Business District Steering Committee, and we adapted that, that exposed aggregate there that was broadcast, which over the years has been messed up pretty good by the replacements because um, nobody knows how to do that stuff right. And um, just one more side note, when the Central Business District was, if you want to see what the Central Business District was supposed to look like, look at the bank. You may recall, if you're old, been in the village long enough, that we had angled uh, parking in our Central Business District. Anybody remember that? Obviously, Mike remembers that, you know. So if you look at what happens in front of the bank, that was the original design of the Central Business District. The bank paid to have that done, okay? So there were raised planters and, and that exposed aggregate, and, and we still had the, the, uh, the angle parking there. When the village went for the grant from the uh, Department of Transportation, they wouldn't let us have the angle parking. They made us go to the right. parallel parking. And, that, and they wouldn't let us raise the planters. Okay? They said, no, that's a, that's a hazard. Won't let that happen. You can use pots. We didn't want to use pots. You know. Um, so it got changed to what is still around a little bit. It's mostly gone now uh, because you filled in a lot of those planting areas uh, over the years and changed a lot of the concrete. But um, just for your, just for everybody's information, that's how those things kind of happened. Okay. Now, if you want to change back to a uh, broomed, finished concrete, that's a decision the board is going to have to go through. But understand that the, the village now is a checkerboard, so it really doesn't matter anymore, you know? You walk down, if you walk from here to my house, down, just, just down to Lionel Road, you'll find some of the original dark, aggregate, you'll find some of the reddish aggregate, you'll find some exposed aggregate, you'll find some broom concrete. You know, the whole town's a checkerboard now, you know, and there really isn't any, any logical way to go back, you know, except to have a massive program of replacing all the sidewalks, and it ain't gonna happen, okay? So, Think about it, and if you want to change it back to uh, the official sidewalk being just a broom finish, okay, you know, but just wanted to have some background because I've been involved in all those things all the way back to the restoration of the train station, the platforms, the, uh, uh, the central business district planning. Incidentally, there are elevations uh, that were prepared for the storefronts. Do you have those? Peter, do you have those? The elevations of all of the storefronts? Yep. In the, there were um, elevations made of all the storefronts I, on, uh, on uh, Burlington. I haven't seen her. Huh? Strider report? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. And Wright. Trustee Pollock, I apologize. I don't think I answered your question. I know where you're going now with, with the laser fish. Um, as far as... <laughs> 
was it going back? No, no, no. You're moving forward. I know what you're talking about. You're probably talking about bringing any um, plans that we receive from um, permit applicants and putting them onto a format that someone can easily come in and take a look at. We do not have that capability. Um, that is something that we probably can look at. I know that a lot of municipalities, um, not many municipalities have that ability to do that, but that is something that we can it's, definitely look into. It's expensive to set up, yeah. but it becomes, you can scan anything and everything, yeah, and, and I, it's searchable too. You and, can search for and words. And maybe um, when they do come in with the GIS, if they provide us with some sort of CAD drawing, we can maybe ha somehow mm -hmm. transport that into the GIS. So that's something that we can definitely look into. I think a lot of those technologies are becoming more and more yeah. affordable every day. Yeah. So. And trust you, Pollock, when we were talking about tablets, we meant like the electronic. <laughs> Not the carved ones. <laughs> Oversupply of chalk. Right. <laughs> you are. You're, you're in it. Okay, next up. Um, I'm going to skip the one uh, with regard to finance in the future because that's going to be our next general, general discussion about uh, some financing alternatives. So next would be increase efficiencies and cost savings for public safety through innovative policies and practices. Some examples, uh, possible use of cameras at village uh, entryways. This was an idea that Trustee Pollock brought forward. Better technology to provide traffic data for en enforcement initiatives. Um, what this refers to as better uh, metering equipment. We just uh, borrowed a meter from uh, a, an adjoining community to help us gather some data for on Fairbank uh, with regard to traffic flow and speeds. And I know that uh, <laughs> Chief Weitzel is looking into uh, some uh, grant opportunities that we might be able to get some equipment like that. And uh, with regard to fire, more efficient use of fire equipment to reduce maintenance and replacement cost. Uh, what that uh, in particular refers to is our, our current practice of sending out the fire trucks whenever the paramedics respond to a call, whether there are better ways to handle that so that we can reduce the maintenance and fuel costs with regard to our larger trucks. As the, as the board knows, when you look at our 10-year capital plan, um, our future fire truck expenses uh, over the next 10 years are in excess of $2 million. So that anything that we can do to prolong the, the, the life, the effective life of this fire equipment would be, would be uh, very important. Um, so are there any questions or discussion about the items we have here? Are there any other items that you would like, Mr. Pollock? Well, I'd be glad to kind of explain uh, what uh, I had suggested about possible use of cameras at village entryways. Um, and I've talked to Chief Weitzel about this briefly. Um, I realize that this, if we pursue this, it's a long-range goal. So that's something that's going to happen this year. It has to be budgeted for. The expense could be significant. But what I have in mind in that regard is uh, a, a camera at each entrance exit to the village that would be used solely for post-incident investigations. Uh, it would not be traffic enforcement. I would not support that for, for, for purposes of traffic enforcement, but simply for post-incident investigation. You know, we all get the emails from our police department, which I appreciate very much, keeping up to date. A suspicious white van so in such and such location reported by a school child or, or, or an adult or whatever. And I'm, every time I read those, I think, gosh, if we had cameras at each exit to the village, you'd find that vehicle. You'd get their license plate. I and mean, the technology is there that you can take photographs and get a license. You know, the data is stored for whatever, however long you want, 60 days, 90 days, whatever, and it's automatically deleted after a certain time period, but it's there. So if they, the police department gets a call about a burglary or whatever, and they've got, <coughs> got a line on a type of vehicle, they can track it down. Uh, it's something I think we really, really ought to look at. I think it's an incredible law enforcement tool. Um, and, and it's something I'd like to see, to know if the village board philosophically is uh, in favor of, of, of looking at that. So this is similar to a, like a toll booth video, the way they're able to, to see cars. Yeah, I suppose, yeah. right. So yeah, they, they, they get a picture of the license, of the license plate, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And so 
if the police get a call saying, you know, this, you know, I, my my garage was burglarized and I saw a guy in a in a in a white sedan leaving. Uh, well, they can go and look at the video and assume that the guy probably left town within an hour after that, and figure out where he left and get his license plate number. Um, so, yeah, and they're, they're you know, not, again, not for traffic enforcement, just for post-incident investigation. I'd like to know what the chief thinks about that. I did have a conversation with Trustee Pollock, and then after speaking with him, both myself and uh, Lieutenant Krill spoke to the Burr Ridge Police Department that currently uses a very sophisticated system. Um, we did talk to the police chief there, and they currently have cameras at the entrance to the subdivisions some of the subdivisions. They're low um, cameras that are very non-intrusive, the way that the uh, vendor um, supplied the, the cameras for the village of Burr Ridge. They have a, a pole with a double head camera for the capture of the vehicle, and then they have overhead cameras for license plate recognition. And you need both because at nighttime, the video cameras will not catch the license plates. The license plate recognition camera will catch the plate in total darkness. Um, they supplied me a document on, on their costs, which is about $11,000, including four cameras, the electrical work that had to go into it, project management, signage that the village puts up to notify individuals that that camera is up. and. Uh, Currently, right now, they're, they're very successful in Burr Ridge because where they have those um, positioned is one way in, one way out of the subdivisions. So there's one, there, there, there's usually an island, a landscaped island, the chief told me. And, you know, so the right hand side will be an entrance into um, like the Heather Fields, he told me, if you know where that is, you know. And then there's one out. So the camera sits in the middle of the island, low grade. It's, he showed me pictures of it, you can't even see it. And then we were able to go there and see um, how they retrieve it. And the, the, the village of Burr Ridge Police Department has the retrieval system in their station. They keep it for 90 days unless they mark it for an incident. It automatically will regenerate itself and make up space on the server um, for the, uh, the, the amount of video that's there. They have made arrests in Burr Ridge from those cameras, um, the incidents that he's told me that they've actually made arrests on were residential burglaries. Um, so, and there is no, their village attorney in Burridge told them that there's no privacy issue. One, some of those subdivisions are technically private, I guess. He said some of the roads aren't owned by the village. Other ones that they are, they're just pointed in the public. There's, there's no, you know, there's no, they're not pointing them in people's windows or in their driveways. Um, and he streamed the video for us so we could see how it works and they're just pointed on the, on the streets. But they're very successful because of the way currently where their cameras are because of the way that the village of Burridge is laid out. Not that he would like to see it expanded beyond that into more public streets, but currently the subdivisions are the ones that have it. And uh, the chief over there is very satisfied with the program. Do you think that would be adaptable to our more highly trafficked entrances and exits from Riverside? Well, um, uh, technically speaking, it will work. The, the, this, the vendor that Burr Ridge had designed it for them, they, they, I watched it, it has no problem with the traffic volume at all. Mm -hmm. um, it could be put in as low, you know, it wouldn't have to be some big giant, you know, monstrosity at the entrance to the village, but it would be more likely if the village trustees wanted to start a program like that, that we go at a slower pace and pick some major intersections in That's and out really of the village, like yeah. Harlem and Long Common mm -hmm. or First and Forest, and then get a gauge for how that's really working. Um, they don't monitor it 24-7 at the Burr Ridge Police Department. It just records, and if they have an incident, they go back for the retrieval. And Trustee Pollock is exactly right. The chief in Burr Ridge told me they, they only use that for post-event incidents. They have that, that, that particular server and stuff is under lock and key for the detectives and himself. And they don't, they don't monitor it. They don't, their dispatchers don't watch it. It's not something that is viewed. It's only viewed if they get a call in that subdivision. Was the cost that you gave per camera or for the four cameras? For the entire program. For the, program. Uh, the chief gave me a, four cameras, uh, electrical work, project management, which was done by their finance director. 
Uh, not that I'm giving Jessica any more work. Um, and um, uh, some uh, signage. Um, and then they, what they did is some of the subdivisions paid for them, so they would have, get a deposit or they get a percentage of it. But he said about the whole project was just around $11,700, just under $12,000 per entrance to this subdivision. Right. That's for each entry wide. Yes. Is about, is about okay. that. How many, it how many requires four cameras. Okay. How many entry points in and out of our town? Did you say about 18 when you counted them up? Yeah, we would. Uh, it would be it would be a significant investment on this board a couple for, to do the dollars. whole village. Yeah. But even Burr Ridge said that they they when they did the first one, you know they did it, they saw how it worked, um, the people in the subdivisions liked it, and then they were expanding it beyond that. But he said it it, it could easily work at you know one or two intersections to start, mm -hmm. and then you could go from you know from there if it if the village wanted to expand it and he did give me the vendor that the village of Burbridge used um, so if we have any other detail or research that would need to be done in the future he said they're very to, responsive um, to, to play the devil's advocate though I mean if you if 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 in order to cover the entire village it would be in excess of two hundred thousand dollars correct if you if you put this kind of camera system at a major intersection isn't it easily identifable by the bad guys and they're just going to go out another way? But the bad, well, the bad guys don't look at our website, though, and see where we have cameras either. They're not but going they're visible. to But they're not going to know. It would, we would think that it's not being done by residents, so it's people from outside. So they would just come into town. They wouldn't. You're giving them a lot more credit than I would. Yeah, I lo they, put them, they don't put them right at the intersection. They're probably three, maybe 100 feet, like in Burridge, like maybe 100 feet into the subdivision where they have the islands, the grass islands. So, if, if, for example, if we did Harlem and Long Common, we would position it maybe 100 to 200 feet towards the village, not towards Harlem, in a, in a, in a westerly direction. Um, the poles stand about as high as this podium that have the double head cameras on them that are globes. Um, they put theirs in the... Uh, you know, with People the brush. The and the signage the that the Burr Ridge does is they develop the sign, and their sign they fix to a, like a speed limit sign or something. They don't go and put special, special post up within the village that says it's being secured. So, so it, you know, if obviously if we were going to pursue something like this, it would be on the next budget cycle. So is, is there interest among the trustees for the... Our, would, there our, be, our, would there be a need to have many more near the schools? Um... You know, that might, uh, well, we do get a lot of these complaints or children that sometimes report that they were approached by an individual and they rolled the window down and maybe spoke to them or said something rude, and then they go home and tell their parents, and then we get the report an hour later, and we have sketchy information. So um, an area around the school would be ideal. You know, for example, 31st and Displains or Woodside, if cars were leaving in a northerly direction from Hauser Central, we might be able to catch mm -hmm. something from that camera. So I, I would agree that the schools would be an area to look at, too, in addition to the, within a block or two of the school, not necessarily in front of the school. I mean, there so, was that incident so our, that, our, of, of that girl wandering out of the school, um, and it, it took one of your officers to find her and bring her back to school. Yes. Along with a resident, correct. Um, so, is there interest in our police department looking into this further? I think so. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not interested in it. Uh, <laughs> I'm clearly out. Yes, but um, mm -hmm. not interested in pursuing. I mean, it seems to me, in the scheme of things, that my personal sense would be that would be two hundred thousand dollars that could be better spent. Oh, I'm not interested in looking at two hundred thousand dollars worth. I'm looking at it. I'm interested in looking at maybe a couple of the major intersections and seeing what we can capture with that. Okay. So, mm -hmm. all right. So as we move through the year, then uh, in your off moments, <laughs> you can you can try to gather some more information for us. Anything else on any of these other items? Okay. Moving on. You want to talk about the fire vehicle? Um, I, I thought I did. Did you have further questions about? No. Um, well, about the response of the engine with the with the ambulance? Did we? Why? I think that's what you're looking for. Why? Why? Why does the ambulance have to go with the engine, or the engine have to go with the ambulance? Chief, right. Well, good evening. Thank you. So, the question is, why does the fire engine have to go with the ambulance? So, let me review of our, how we are staffed currently at the fire department, and so. From Monday through Friday, from 8 to 6, um, we have a, a crew of three staffing the fire engine. 
and then the paramedic ambulance is staffed 24 7 with two on the weekends or after 6 p.m only the paramedic two paramedics are here during that time when a call comes in the paramedics if it's an ems call or ambulance call the paramedics go out by themselves with two two people if the call comes in um, that may be significant the paramedics have the ability to request additional assistance by calling us out so the manpower will respond to the station and they will respond in our four-wheel expedition vehicle the fire engine will not go out at that that time period if it's monday through friday 8 to 6 p.m however any ems call goes that that comes in the paramedics obviously respond and then the three uh, firefighters on the fire engine will also respond so the question is 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 there efficiencies that we can improve upon as far as maintenance costs the answer to that is, is yes of course but you have to also understand that we also have patient efficiencies meaning that when the paramedics get on call on, on the scene of an incident they have to bring in a lot of equipment so if, for example, if one of you would have a heart attack or actually have difficulty breathing, the paramedics then will uh, minimally will bring in uh, three pieces of equipment, a very large bag that carries oxygen and, and what they call their go bag, a medication bag, which is just as large, and obviously the uh, EKG defibrillator. That's the minimal equipment they'll bring in. They'll, be, they'll begin their, their care, their paramedic care, their, their advanced life support, starting IVs, getting you stabilized, doing a 12-lead EKG, perhaps giving you medications. Then those paramedics then will have to package you up in, in the house, put you under a stretcher. First, they have to bring the stretcher in from the ambulance and then bring you out in the ambulance. And obviously, like tonight, that could be very treacherous. So after hours, there's only two of them performing all these tasks. So. The question is, is that there is patient efficiencies when you have more people on the scene, whether it's a advanced life support call or whether it's just somebody that just fell down the stairs in the basement. You still have to take that patient, package that patient out, and remove that patient out to the ambulance. And so again, um, when, when you look at maintenance versus what we, we provide as far as patient care on the scene, we have to be cautious because there are other um, avenues and other things that you have to be be looking at other than just the maintenance cost of that fire engine so recognizing that there's that the extra manpower is helpful on the call does the fire truck bring anything that's essential to the scene other than the other than the, the personnel they, they will also assist the EMS crew would bring is the patients. vehicle is the vehicle the vehicle, nothing on the vehicle per se um, will be brought in any equipment on there okay, unless so it's an accident or then something. Then our question to you would be could you look into ways of transporting that additional personnel without it being on a fire truck? We could. Okay. That that's but, something that we would ask for you to look into, I right. think is what but, I'm saying. I, and I when you look at that also I I have too, because the other um, badge that we wear is also on the fire side. And so if we deploy uh, resources in a non-fire uh, apparatus, such as the four-wheel vehicle, if a call comes in for a fire call, which is, which is more manpower intensive, there will be a significant delay that will result by those people not being on that fire engine. So again, there's efficiencies not only on the EMS, EMS side, but also on the fire side too. And so there's, we stand the risk of not having the right piece of apparatus with the right um, manning when a call comes in um, at that particular incident, if that makes sense. I understand, but we are a very small village and we're talking minutes. Yeah, the word, we're, yeah um, I, well, I just think, I, I, and you know what I mean? It's like to, to send out the fire truck on every call to me seems like an inefficient use of a vehicle. Um, so I'm not saying that we're going to solve it today. I'm just saying oh. if you could look into this and what are some of the options that we would have and that type of thing, I think that's what we're looking for. Okay. And the, the other day, and I, 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 I worked this through my head, I, I was, I saw firemen shoveling out fire hydrants. Yes. With the fire truck. It just seemed like, you know, driving a fire truck around to shovel out fire hydrants. And I was thinking, well, oh, probably there's two of them. So that is probably, you know, they needed to have the fire truck with them. But um, just, it, it, it's... And again, it's not about 
and the manning floor is shoveling out a hydrant, but it's, it's if a call comes in, particularly if it depends on where the call comes in and if there's a train, you know, we, we look at seconds and minutes when, I, when we have to deploy resources immediately. So yeah. if, we, if we send crews out by themselves and they don't have the, piece of, the right piece of apparatus at that time, we're delayed. And, and so that, that's, that's what's Am I correct, though, that, that we are interested in attempting to find better efficiencies with regard to our trucks? All the yeah, so that's what we're asking, okay. is to see if there's ways we can do things better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So anything else on these, these items? Last is to enhance beautification of public green spaces and recreational facilities. Examples include increased park and recreational field maintenance and beautification, increased access to riverfront and nature areas, and increased wilderness and habitat, rest habitat restoration through cooperation with governmental and other organizations. Um, you should know that, there, that these are already significantly underway. There has been uh, extensive interaction between our Parks and Recreation Department and our Public Works Department in preparation for this coming, uh, this coming spring and summer, which will actually eventually get here. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite confident that those, that those efforts are well in hand. And the other, the other two here really, in some ways, fall more directly under the CMAP priorities that uh, are already being looked at fairly extensively. And Trustee Sussman is, is really kind of running the, the group organization of the various commissions and organizations along with Chicago Wilderness that are looking at, at, those, at those items. So are there any other things with regard to, please? Can I just say something briefly please about do. that? There, there is a, a group of representatives from the commissions that's meeting regularly to, along with staff to look at CMAT, and we're in the process of doing our own prioritization, recognizing that it's a, it's a function of how much staff time we have as well as what the costs are going to be. So I think that pretty soon I'll be able to talk about what those priorities are and to actually show project plans that are being put together, not just with the commission members, but with staff as well. Um, and we do have some priorities that we're working on. I can talk about or I can just come back in and do the whole thing at once. But CMAP's clearly a priority, I think, for, for and that group the commissions you, the, and the group that you're staff. that you're facilitating is really making great strides on that, and that includes our, our parks and recreation department, our public works department, are yep. all are all part of it. So I think by early spring, um, if you want to come back and maybe yep. bring the other chairs Absolutely. with you, that would be great. So yes, sir, please. Um, I, I applaud Jean for for jumping on that and being part of it. Um, I think this is the, the, the part of the agenda that excites me the most. Um, we spend a big part of our time talking about sidewalk squares, police trucks, salt, all the things that really aren't fun. Um, you know, to Richard's point, growing up in this village, this village used to be more fun. It used to be way more prettier than it is now. Um, and we had a lot more activity from the residents utilizing our parks and our riverfront. Uh, when you could see it, you can't. And part of the CMAP thing is uh, harkens to the importance of the river and why we're here. And, and the whole basis of, of Mr. Olmstead coming to this area was the river. Right now, you can't see it. You can't use it. There's very little access to it unless you just walk down and jump in it yourself. Um, the CMAP talks of river paths. It talks of canoe launches. Um, and access to the waterway. Um, this is a waterway that is all of ours and we should be able to use it. And I think it's part of what gives Riverside its overall character. We would be nothing without the river. Um, it, it's what drew us here and it's why we all kind of live here. I would love to see the implementation of a path system along the river. Um, I, I know Richard's not gonna approve of this, but I would like to see us be able to see the river more. Um, the project that went on this summer that, uh, or early fall, behind the library in the Village Hall was a, a probably very stark and, and, and shocking to most people because of the level of clearing that we did back there. Um, but one has to understand that that's how it used to be. And we as a village have neglected our riverfront um, and in, in part because we don't have the money to spend on it. 
and we've spent our money on buying fire trucks, police cars, lockers, cameras. We talk of all these things that, in my mind, are, are necessary to function in today's world. But the whole reason that we pay the taxes that we live in this town is to have fun. And I want to see us start talking about using our parks, using the river, getting back down to the river, um, and, and, and utilizing that area. I mean, it, it's our largest single asset, besides all the historical buildings that we have in this town and our historical status. So I, for one, would like to be part of any talk or discussion or groups that uh, President Sells, you spoke a, a while back of gathering the commissions and taking a walk and, and seeing what the feasibility. Let, I say, let's once the snow clears, let's put our boots on and take a walk. Um, the river is a beautiful thing, and it flows past us every day, and we don't pay attention to it. We can't see it. We can't use it. We can't touch it. So I'd like to see more of that. It, it may sound mundane to some people, but perhaps if we were a destination for canoeing, for kayaking, that would spur business development. Perhaps if we were a destination or you had a place to walk with your kids or ride your bike along the river, we're not the only town in this country that is situated on a body of water. But if you look at every major municipality that is, look at Chicago. They have miles and miles and miles and miles of paths. And they kept their whole front yard open to the lake. Um, people boat on it, bike on it, walk on it, run on it. Um, I want to be able to provide the residents the same ability to utilize the riverfront in that aspect. And that's all I have to say about it. Mr. Powell. I'd like to say very well said, Trustee Foley, and I agree completely. Um, one of the unique things about Riverside is that if you go to any modern village, suburb, town, homes back up to the rivers or mm -hmm. the lakes because the developers make money off of those lots. Mm -hmm. Riverside, our river is exposed to the whole community and we absolutely need to take better advantage of that. So you thank know, you for and, saying and that. And to your point, Mr. Pollock, Trustee Pollock, uh, the exposing of the riverfront behind here exposed an eyesore, and that's our youth center. And yet, one of the memorandums that I saw this week, we talked about putting a $300,000 roof on that building. And I really think that's a total waste of money. We've exposed a building that's well past its age, it's needed a lot of repair, but that single building is sitting on probably one of the biggest, most valuable pieces of dirt in this town. And if we could find another use for that site or the building or both, then we would benefit from that. Um, it's where the hotel used to be. The foundation of that building sits on the foundation of the old hotel. Um, well, the old foundation behind the garage here. Right. The refractory. Right. But but the point is is that the people that were here before us utilized it. We don't. We've ignored it. We've completely ignored it. If there's anybody that says that we've put an, a penny into looking at the river or cleaning it up, I, I, I don't believe that. I, well, I, I think that was that's a little harsh. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of work that has been done down at Swan Pond to open up the river. Um, to, to for what? To, to, to see it. it. I mean, they, the, the Army Corps they they. You know, I, 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 I agree with they changed, they changed I, the topography. I, I, I agree, the agree with what you're saying turn. that we should use the, the we should use the river, but you know along with along with all to, to use it, you know we need to be able to fund it. We need to be able to maintain it. And, and I agree, uh, Joe. To build it, to build and to and 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 I don't want to get into all this because I because it's too. But all of these you know these ideas of taking a path and and. You know, running from the scout cabin out to here and running over there and, and all these places, they're wonderful. And we'll, we, we build it and then we can't maintain it unless we can figure a way to fund it and, and somehow maintain it on a regular basis. Um, it'll fall by these, these ideas will fall by the wayside um, all the time. And we can, we can pave our, our streets with, with, uh, reports and ideas and all these things that come up but we got to find a way to fund them and maintain them and, and that that is that is the probably the 
the single most important thing we need to, to do is because once we figure that out, then we can then maybe we can attack some of these things. How are we going to pay for it? Th this stretch that was clear back here was done to Mr. Pollock's point earlier. This town lives and breathes off volunteerism. I, 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 you know, and I, I that was, whole area was cleared. And, but, but, but we can't even we can't even agree that that was a good, bad, or a different idea. Right, right. So if you can get volunteerism to do the upfront construction of it and then rely on the on the village for the maintenance part of it, are we not are we not trying to save some money by even looking at it? But who? What? What? What department is is at our point that they have the extra time to? maintain all this. I mean, I, I, I excuse me, the, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the, this ad hoc group that's getting together is meeting with, is going to have recommendations, is working with staff people, recognizing that there's an upfront cost as well as an ongoing maintenance. And I'm not certain, I'm sorry, Mr. You're, President. You're 100% really, right. This, this we're is, we're we, not working it right now. We've but gone we too do, far down the road. We understand what Ben very carefully gave us, what our, our purpose is. We've been working on it. We'll have recommendations. Um, and you know, all these things are being considered by representatives from the commissions and by staff members. We're just not ready quite yet to come forward. Okay. So before we move on to the uh, more specific discussion about finance, um, are there any other items, either from the trustees or from any of our department heads who are here, any ideas that you think should be part of this overarching consideration for 2014. Does this last one that we went over include forestry, like the issue with the ash borer and that type of thing? Would you include that in the section that we just went over? Under the beautification? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So that handles our strategy component of this. Uh, but the next item, which is, is closely, closely related, has to do uh, with with financing, as as the discussion we just heard, financing the future and how we're going to pay for things. Uh, there are are three items under this, with regard to intergovernmental intergovernmental cooperation, and creative use of alternative revenue streams. Uh, some of these are already underway. The increased cooperation with school districts and other public and private bodies to provide services and share facilities. We're trying to work toward an agreement, for example, with regard to funding of the crossing guards with District 96 and District 208. Um, the designation, designation of existing revenue streams for specific purposes, um, that, that is something that I think is worth uh, you know, a future discussion. Uh, there have been some suggestions made, for example, of using you know, specific tax taxes that are levied for with regard to downtown development. But but the one that's most uh, significant tonight that, that we need to talk about is the uh, the potential rollover of the expiring general obligation bonds. Um, and uh, this is an item that has been discussed for as long as I was a trustee and now president. I know it, I, it goes back at least two boards prior to this. Um, and and we've known that this day is coming. What what we're talking about here are the, are the road bonds that are going to be expiring in 2014. Uh, and there was a determination made by the prior board that this would be a potential funding source for our capital needs moving forward. Uh, the reason I think that this was attractive to the prior board is that were we to uh, were we to roll over, so to speak, or reissue these bonds for another purpose, it would have it would have no impact on the residential tax burden. It would be a a, a neutral uh, impact in terms of of taxation. So that's the, that's the general idea. The way I thought we would go into this is uh, first have uh, Director Francis give us an overview of how, how the bonding system works, and then Mr. Mars can give us a little background as to the technical aspects of, of how such a referendum would be put forward. But um, I think that as we listen to these technical items, I think that it's important, and, and I have no, I, I think that we should put no pressure on ourselves whatsoever tonight to try to reach any kind of decision or resolution about this. This is a very important topic um, that deserves prolonged discussion discussion uh, because, of course, a bond is at, at its essence is a funding mechanism. So the, 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 
prior discussion, once we kind of get the technicalities laid out for us, will be what kind of things do we need to address with regard to our capital needs that this might be a potential uh, useful apparatus for. So, Director Francis, do you want to? Can I just make a comment? Of course, please um, do. Thank you. Um, I, I just I just want to clarify um, that what we're going to hear is really just technical information about how bonds are rolled over, what uses bonds can, you know, how a, bo a bond rollover goes, how, what kind of a referendum, what items can be grouped together. But we still have a lot of information that we have to digest and prioritize as, in terms of our um, plans for capital improvements going forward before we can ever make any kind of a decision as to whether or not we would like to do a rollover. I think that's, at least I think, that's my feeling. I think that's exactly correct. So, Ms. Francis? Okay, so essentially we have bonds that were issued back in 2004, as President Sells had mentioned, for road improvements. They are retiring. Um, in order for the Village of Riverside to issue any new debt, we do have to go to referendum if we choose to issue any new debt. Um, basically, you have a couple of different options if you choose to issue debt. First, you have to look at your list of projects that you want to finance. And then you have to figure out the life of those particular um, capital improvement and or assets that you wish to acquire. So that is also the decision factor as to whether or not you're going to have a maturity schedule of 10 years, 15 years, or 20 years. Because if you're going to do, for example, you can't purchase vehicles for and issue debt for it because rating agencies are going to say, well, wait a minute, these things are not aligned. Your asset life for a squad, for example, is only five to six years. You cannot go ahead and issue debt for that. Um, for example, if you have fire vehicles with a longer asset life, that would be a potential option. Um, with regard to the various capital asset lives, we did provide a table just to show the board as to the various improvements and or assets and the life schedule. Um, as it relates to issuances, the village actually has the ability to issue it for a multitude of different things. It's not just strictly limited to items that are under the capital projects fund. For example, you can issue general obligation debt for water and sewer improvements, for parking lot improvements, or for improvements that would fall under the capital projects fund for non-enterprise related projects. Um, and usually that is the tendency because enterprise funds are usually financed by user fees. Um, also with regard to issuing debt, you have up to, on a referendum, you have up to three questions of similar, similarly situated projects. For example, if you have a streetscape program that you wish to have listed, that would be one project. If you have a sidewalk program, that would be one project. Um, it usually, as um, Attorney, Mar Attorney Mars or Melina <coughs> can attest to, it's easier for the resident to then decide which projects are listed, it's clear to them, and then they can vote yes or no on the related items. And that's why they always say to do similarly situated projects in each individual question. But like I said, you have an up to a maximum of three, though you do not have to do three questions. You can do as little as one. Um, and that is pretty much a high overview of just issuing debt. Obviously, there is a process and a calendar which Attorney Mars can um, speak to. Um, so uh, before we hear from Mr. Mars, do you have any general questions from Director Francis? Okay. When is your bond set to expire? December? December of this year. So essentially, if we were to want to keep the, the levy flat as it relates to debt. It's 250000 basically that we collect annually, and it's been level. Um, it only increases incrementally 
by, by CPI, which is, is very minimal on an annual basis. However, in order to keep the first installment of the 2015 property tax bills at that level so that there wouldn't be um, a decrease and then an increase um, noticed by a resident, it would have to be issued prior to the first installment, basically in December. So it would have to be a question November. in November. Yeah. What would be the... Uh, if, if we if we didn't if we didn't roll over these bonds and didn't go to, to referendum to do this what would be the savings that, are, that the average resident would see on their tax bill um, for an average tax bill of ten thousand um, that includes all taxing bodies um, they would see a decrease of approximately seventy six dollars of the village portion so if you have a fifteen thousand dollar tax bill it's going to be one and a half of that What is the village portion of the tax bill? 14.9%. Can you say that one more time just real loud? 14.9%. Okay. And as we noted this morning at the police pension meeting, well, we should have noted, um, almost pretty much 10%, well, more than 10% of that is actually goes to, directly to the police pension fund. So of the tax bill that people pay, only 14% comes to the village. 14.9%. 14. 14.9%. I'm sorry, I did not mean to discount that. It's actually declined because as other taxing bodies' bills have gone up, for instance, the school districts, our share has gone down. But as of the second installment of, of, of last year, it was still 14.9%. Okay. So on a $10,000 tax bill, how much goes to the village? 14.15%. Okay, and how much goes to the school districts? 27% to District 208, 42% to District 96. What's your point, Joe? I just want to make sure people understand that, because people I don't think people understand I don't think, that. No, people I agree with you. That. I don't think people, people understand, don't understand that, that. I, I, I agree. I was, I, was, I, 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 I was cornered by somebody that, that took me to task on it, and when I explained it to him, um, it, the conversation turned drastically. So um, let's make sure people understand that since we're since we're there. Thanks Thank you. For the <laughs> Thanks for the lead. I, I have a question about um, this grouping of like items um, and how finely that definition has to be cut. Yeah. For instance, um, can streets and sidewalks be in the same? category or do they have to be yes. separate a lot of it has to do with well one bond council has to be okay with it as and it it relates to clarity of the uses is one aspect the other aspect is the vaguer you you have the uses uh, the less likely it the more likely yeah. it is to create a negative perception i mean because if you can't tell what it's going to be used for it makes it more difficult to pass a referenda tend to do well when they're more specific rather right. than less on the other hand you know and and that may get into if you have specific things but there's a concern that one might be viewed as more desirable than another you might want to split them for that reason so if one you don't you don't lose the whole thing because one is less popular right. than another. But having said that, from a legal perspective, you can you can be more broad. Right. You know. Uh, I mean, to my way of thinking, streetscape in in Riverside, streets and sidewalks kind of belong together. You know, ones for vehicles, ones for feet, but they both get us around the village. Sure, <laughs> and, that, and that would be fine. It would just be a matter of as we got closer, sort of crafting the question to capture mm -hmm. right. capture that effectively. But you definitely want to know everything you want to use those dollars on. Sure. Because you need to make sure that's sure. accurately and fully captured by the question, Absolutely. so that after the fact, you don't find yourself you know, aced out of using money. That right. So, so kind of going into that with regard to the, the three questions that you were talking about, because I'm still not quite clear on this. Yeah, so that, that comes just from the, the, the fact that the municipality has a max, there can, there can be a maximum of three referenda, not just related to bond issues, period. On any given ballot, but let's let's say for the sake of discussion, let's let's say that we wanted to have a referendum, a for a two million dollar referendum for for ten years. Okay, let's say that that's what. So, if we had three separate questions, each of which was for a two million dollar amount, what happens if more than one passes? 
Well, you would. You you would. They would. They have to be independent of each so other. So in they aggregate, they could not be more than two million. Well, they, they, they can be whatever they are, but they have to add up to this. If you're trying to maintain parity, you have to do the reverse math. How many years is it going to take to, to pay it off? And at the end of the day, Jessica's got to be able to say, well, it's going to be $250,000 yeah, of annual income will we'll get this paid. I, I'm, I'm not being clear about my okay. question because I don't understand what you I'm trying to You would need to, if, if you had three referenda you were running, they would have to add up to a, a 250000 per year that would be used to pay them. Okay, and if any uh, one of them okay. did not pass, you wouldn't have that money. Okay. And you that, wouldn't have the total you would have of less. that okay. $2 million. So okay. people would see their property taxes go down. If we're talking about an average of 76 a year and you ran two and one of them was a bigger project than another and the bigger one passed, you, you, they so would So if you had three questions, each one would be for $700,000, more or less. That's or, actually, yes. right. so one right. or some combination. Yeah, but it depends on how many right. years you want to pay off. And that relates, I, yeah. that relates to as you group things together, too, because the, you have to have like things in like categories. So you can't have a depreciating, let's say, a building combined with a road with very different depreciation periods and then say oh. we're going to do 20 years. Because that, that, and the bond council is going to weigh in on that. So I, to, to my way of thinking, the first thing to do is not worry too much about what you can put together, but to decide and prioritize what do you want to do it and what is the most important? And generally speaking, bonds you're better off using for the greater depreciation and then use the money you save that you were thinking, oh, this is coming up, this is coming up in, a cap in capital improvements for the, for the things that are of shorter life mm -hmm. spans and use your general fund for that. You end right. up with the same amount of money, and they're right. all being used for capital funds, but the bonds are limited to those things which take a long time to wear out and depreciate. So, so and that unfortunately, we have lots of those. A lot of choices, side. yeah. <laughs> so, so to that point, then, for example, looking at, at, at Director Francis's memo, I mean, she shows here building and build the capital item building and improvements has right. a 50-year span, infrastructure 50 to 70. Versus, for example, let's say machinery and equipment, which would have five to ten. So, therefore, the machinery and equipment would not properly lend itself to to, to a combination with right. the other. Right. Well, unless you wanted to ac accelerate the payment on the on the higher, you, you see what I mean? Because yeah. because you're you're more than welcome to to have a, a shorter period for a thing like a building if you can afford it, because right. there's Got no it. there's no harm in that. You just can't take. 20 years to pay off something that's going to wear out in 10. Right. So, so again, it comes down to you sort of choosing these, you're, you're putting your options, prioritizing, and then we'll work ba backwards with bond council to figure out the most effective wording and how they can be grouped. So, and, and if you'll notice, I'm sorry, um, included as the preliminary listing straight from the capital improvement plan, I've actually taken out anything with less any asset life that was less than 10 years. So, just so they. If this is going to go on, if, if we did this, if it went on the ballot in November, since it has to go before the bond council on that, what type of timing are we talking about that we need to have this totally decided by? Mike, Mike you want to handle that? That's a nice segue. Yeah. 14.9%. Um, <laughs> <laughs> At the end of your packet, there's a, a couple-page memo that I did uh, relative to, to some of these issues surrounding the referendum. Um, first of all, we're talking about general obligation bonds, which mean they're secured by uh, the property taxes levied against the property within the village. And um, th that's a very common method of financing, and it's attractive to investors uh, because of the, the safety of that, uh, that being secured by the property and the, and the tax levy. Um, as a non-home rule unit, uh, you, that's why you have to go to referendum in this particular case. Uh, it's, it's not many instances of non-home rule communities being able to issue general obligation uh, bonds without a referendum. And so there's, there's several steps in terms of this referendum uh, uh, timeline. And the, the first is what you're doing now, which is sort of starting to figure out what type of things and, and uh, objects you might want to use this financing for. 
um, and, and I think that's obviously going to be the longest step. Um, you have to have it figured out as we get later in the summer because uh, you have to adopt an ordinance relative to the referendum by August uh, 18th in order to, to make the timelines of getting it certified and on the ballot. Um, and so, it, you know, as you go through the process, like I said, we'll sort of pare down the things. And by the time we get to the meetings just prior to that, uh, and you can do it as early as you want, but that's the latest you can do it. Uh, you'll have the questions crafted exactly as you want them on the ballot because once you pass that ordinance, that's then transmitted to uh, the, the Cook County clerk for placement on the ballot. Um, as Jessica mentioned, the election that we're shooting for here is November 4th, uh, which is a general election. Um, at that election, uh, it, you know, after the election, we'll canvass the votes and see if it passes. If it, all it needs is a majority of the electors uh, within the village. And if, if it did receive a majority, you have to wait 30 days, uh, sort of an election contest period before you can actually sell the bonds. But uh, everything will sort of be poised so that if you are successful, you're ready to go right into that sales mode. Um, once they're approved, you have uh, five years um, to actually issue the bonds. So w once you get that approval, you don't need to, to actually rush into it if you want to, uh, if the timing isn't right in terms of interest rates or that sort of thing. And then uh, once they are sold uh, and you've adopted your bond ordinance and, and setting forth the interest rates and everything, uh, then the tax levy starts and you're getting the proceeds and starting on your projects. So if we waited to issue the bonds, it could happen where someone's tax bill would go down and then come back up. Right. right. This presumes you would probably sell them right yeah, away. Yeah, the idea I think is to roll right, right into mm -hmm. it, but yeah. I, I just wanted to mention okay. that. Yeah, because you, you can't levy until until they're completed. Yeah. Right. Right. And then the end of the memo just talks a little bit about uh, <coughs> what the board can and can't do in terms of uh, essentially stumping for the referendum. You can't use public funds to, to mm -hmm. uh, push either for or against a referendum. Uh, but you can uh, distribute factual information relative to the referendum. And so if you end up going down this road with the referendum, uh, we'll give you more guidance uh, so you're confident in what you're saying and doing as you uh, circulate with the public. Can staff prepare something to be sent? Is that a use of um, yeah. public funds? They can yeah. prepare yeah. the factual information. As long as it's factual, we, yeah. we're used to reviewing those things for that kind of test. Things like what were asked was, if this passed on a, a tax bill of $10,000, what would the effect to be or that kind of thing that those are those are factual those aren't <coughs> so so with regard to the attorney review aspect of it though i mean uh, we have we I mean, our, our kind of the drop dead date is august 18th to pass the ordinance yes yeah but when when would we have to have our work done so that to go through bond council you would you would want to have the list of things you really wanted to do i think comfortably you would want by your first meeting in june at the latest i would think to just give chapman and cutler or whoever bond council is going to be a chance to work with us and to make sure everything is done correctly but i mean that's that's what would be best and, and there's also and i don't know who this this should be directed to there's also something with regard to the time in which you have to expend the funds like did you tell me that half over half the, has to the be the bulk of it rule of thumb is the bulk of it within the first two years but you have up to three years mm -hmm. to spend all, all of, it? of it correct yeah, you, you can't levy until they're issued and then once they're issued you've got to spend it within three years yeah so f five years to issue three years to spend okay so just on on this aspect of the consideration, are there any thoughts or questions that you might have, Mr. Pollock? Yes, uh, several. Um, first of all, I, you know, I feel like I kind of feel like we almost have an obligation to ask our residents this question. Um, I mean, if you look at the capital needs of the village over the next several years and forever. Uh, I almost feel like we'd be remiss not to ask the residents. If they say no, they say no, and we figure out other, other things, other ways to pay for these things in the future. But I do feel strongly that, that we at least have to ask the question. I mean, it's up to the residents to decide. It's not up to us. 
but, but, but we do have to ask. And several numbers jump out at me. 14.9% for one. Uh, yeah, I had to get my, everyone else has said it, so, so yeah, we, yeah, that's our portion of the tax bill, 14.9%, but seriously, the numbers that jump out at me, did I hear correctly that on a $10,000 tax bill, we're talking about $76? Yes. Okay, so, th you know, that really jumps out as a pretty small number. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about, you know, annually $76. The other number that jumps out at me, uh, equally so, $76 on one end, a quarter million dollars on the other end. And that quarter million dollars is the interest we pay on going into debt. So It's not just interest, isn't it? Interest in principle? No. The, well, the, according to this chart, if you take $2.275 2 in principle, you end up paying just short of a quarter million dollars in interest. Is that, am I reading oh, that correctly? Over time. Over that time. Yeah. Right, okay. over time. Yeah. yeah so, um, and what I'm leaving with that is, uh, you know, we're talking about a rollover. You know, if, if we, we just paid a quarter million dollars for these bonds that we're getting ready to retire. <coughs> I, I can almost guarantee you that in 10 years, if we do this, we're going to be talking about rolling it over again. So it, to me, it begs the question, shouldn't we just ask residents if they want their tax bill to be $76 more a year period, as opposed to asking them to borrow more money? Ms. Francis, would you? I, I, well, I personally would rather pay the $76 and just know that all of my money is going toward the village as opposed to that big chunk of it going toward interest. Just logistically, um, if you were to ask a referendum question, basically you'd start at the baseline of that seven seventy six dollars and because of CPI annual increases and things that would kind of tweak up. Um, you could, on the other hand, still try to keep that flat and then you abate the difference of it increasing. So it would incrementally increase, but then you debate it so that property taxpayers wouldn't necessarily see that, that increase that I'm speaking of. Um, but on the other hand, the, the disadvantage of it is you're not using present day dollars to do all those projects. So you're only having that 250,000 on an annual basis. So, so there's, there's good and bad to that. You're not getting a sudden influx of cash that you can spend all at once. Right, right. right. Gentlemen, could you, if you guys are going to have a conversation, could you go outside? Thanks. Um, this is complicated enough as it is. <laughs> uh, you know, I would say there, there, another logistical difference that I can think of with regard to that is one of one of the niceties of the the bond issuance is you can actually specify in the question itself what the uses of the money will be for. Um, with regard to a, a generalized you know, tax increase, it's very, as you know, it's very convoluted and almost impenetrable language that is required by state statute with regard to, to a tax increase, which, right. which, it'll, which. It'll also have to include a reference to the tax cap and that makes it even more. Yeah, I mean, it's all, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, so it, it just, from a logistical standpoint, uh, it, it makes it much more difficult to, to pass. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also think that um, rolling over a bond is, in terms of the understandability of it, and the, um, I, I just think it's an, an easier way to finance our considerable needs. And, and it co there's a cost to it, but there, you know, passing a refinance bond referendum and passing a tax increase are two different things. I think that's right, and 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 I think you know with regard to going. This is kind of a continuation of the question. I think it. Uh, I think it is also, in some ways, more. It's clearer to the resident that the money is going to be used for a specific purpose, mm -hmm. uh, whereas you can't really tie a generalized tax to a specific purpose. You can say that that's what you're going to do, but you are not then required to it, to do it that way, whereas with the bond, yeah, you, you are required. You could to. bind future boards right. if, with a general. So, I mean, so those are just some of the considerations. question for the attorneys, can you, can you ask both questions? A 
bond rollover or well you can't ask them alternatively okay you can ask for both I don't think I'd want to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you cannot ask. There's no way you, to you ask. You can't the ask the referenda questions no. in the alternative. That's what I thought, and and I understand the cons of that. But I felt like it's given the numbers, it's something you have to think about at least. Yeah. There was a consider. there was a municipality that I mean, it, there was one that it, it really called out for an alternative. If one, not the other, and it was where uh, they had gone to a, reach the population to have a board of fire and police, and went to an Article Three pension fund like you have. And the issue was to create it by referendum, but they had to run both questions, including how to fund it, and it ended up where it passed one passed and not the funding part. So it was actually a problem, but there was no other way. Yeah. To, to say, you know, if this is created, do you want it funded? It, you know, that kind of thing. There's just no way to do that in the election laws. Um, just a suggestion. I, I'm wondering if the best way to proceed at this point, given the information we've got tonight, is is for, I mean, I think, I, I, I sense that there's a consensus that if, if we were going to do this, of course, it would have to be for capital expenditures. It would have to be for long-term, long-life capital expenditures. Uh, now that we have more information about the, the grouping concept, I wonder if it's not better for us to let staff prepare some alternative scenarios for us to consider at our next meeting, and then we can we can get into great. more with regard to the actual, because as, as we all understand, this is just a mechanism. The question is, what are our village needs, mm -hmm. and how are we going to meet them? So is that is that agreeable with everyone? Does, Anything else with regard to this? Yeah. Anything else from staff at all? No? Um, so that's it for tonight. Any new business? We do have a need for an executive session at which we will discuss collective negotiating matters between public employers, employers and their employees or representatives, and also the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees. No final action will be taken during the executive session. I would ask for a motion to adjourn, not to reconvene. So moved. Motion by Ms. Hamilton. Second. Second by Mr. Ballerine. Please call the roll. Trustee Sosa. Aye. Trustee Hamilton. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Ballerine. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Trustee Collins. Aye. Meeting is adjourned. Aye.